Just the gloomy clouds of night and death's dark shadows put to fly. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to Good morning, everyone. You may be seated. Welcome to Christ Church. This is the first Sunday of Advent. And I, in my opinion, Advent began last night. Do you share that opinion? If you missed last night, you missed a little bit of heaven. And so don't think it begins this morning, although on the calendar it probably does. Last night, it's a great night for all the vocalists, instrumentalists. We really appreciate what you did. Advent, the first Sunday of the season is an emphasis on hope. Each one of the small candles represents a gift that Jesus gave to us through his entrance into this world. Each week we'll be focusing on one of those gifts. Today it's hope. You know, there's an advent that's already taken place. The entrance of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior into this world. But there's an advent to come. And that's the second coming of Jesus Christ. And we celebrate that also. So there's the Advent that's happened, the Advent that's going to come, and we're in the in-between time. Now, I don't know about you, but the in-between time isn't always easy. Life is hard. I read a book one time, the first sentence, life is hard. And I said, oh, great, now I have to read the whole rest of the book. <laughs> but it is, it's difficult, there's challenges. And sometimes being a Christian brings even more challenges. We need something to get us through. And that something is hope. It's not the hope the world gives. It's not in material things. It's not in financial security. It's not even in other human beings. As important as those three things are, and as, as Jesus has a will in all three of those things, that's not where our hope comes from. Our hope comes in the person of Jesus Christ. He didn't snatch hope out of the universe. He is hope. 
And so if you're seeking hope in any other way other than Jesus Christ, you are missing it. Let me read Romans 15, 13. And I'll make a comment in between because that's what preachers do. <laughs> May the God of hope do what? Fill you with great joy and peace as you do what? As you trust in him. And what's the result of that? So that you may overflow with hope. And how's that done? By the power of the Holy Spirit. And no other way. He is the only true hope. I stand here today. It's my sister's birthday and she's in heaven. She passed away about a year ago. We hoped that she would have more years of life here on this earth, but she's fully restored and rejoicing today. And um, my faith was formed greatly when I was a child through the hymns and choruses of children's uh, church and big people's church. And as I reflected on hope, these words came to me in my spirit. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean, put my whole weight on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. No other, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand, but not the ground of Christ. We stand on a solid rock. He lives, he's eternal, he's able, and he's gone to prepare a place for us for eternity in heaven. Thanks be to God, he is the God of hope. We practice this for a half hour. There, we got it. The candle of hope. Give the candle of hope a round of applause. What a gift. I invite your attention on the screen as we read our prayer together. And let's stand for the morning prayer. Almighty God, as we enter this season of Advent and await the coming of our Savior, give us the courage to hope. Help us to see your plans of redemption for our lives, for this community, and for the world. We pray that this time will be different. This Christmas, help us to stop rushing. Help us to breathe and take notice of you and your works in this world. May we be mindful of our actions, that they be peace-filled and our words loving as Christ is in the world. Faithful God, out of war's chaos, you bring the order of peace. Renew us in hope that we may work towards Christ's advent of peace among all nations. God of promise, God of hope, into our darkness come. Through Jesus Christ, who is the source of our redemption and hope. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Praise God. Actually, can you stand to your feet so we can worship together? <laughs> he told y'all to sit down. I said, oh, wait, no, let's stand up together. <laughs> We're going to sing this um, carol together that I think everybody knows. Angels from the realms of glory. Come on, let's sing together. Angels from the realms of glory, we your fire.
bless your name this morning, God. We just love you. God, we, we are so thankful for this Advent season, God. We thank you so much for the gift of Jesus and who he is and who he was and who is to come. Thank you, God. We bless your name in Jesus' name. Lord, we just lift your precious name your beautiful name, your powerful name. How many of you know that there is no other name like Jesus? Hallelujah, hallelujah. You are the word at the beginning, one with God the Lord most high. You're his
somebody and you have no equal now and forever God you reign come on somebody say it say yours is the king come on somebody and yours is the glory yours is the name above come on somebody say what a powerful name what a powerful name up the name of Jesus in this room. Come on, somebody. Oh, clapping is good, but can you lift the name of Jesus in this room? Come on, lift the name of Jesus, the powerful name of Jesus, the matchless name of Jesus. Come on, the healing name of Jesus. No other name but Jesus. No name higher than Jesus. Lift his name in this room. Lift his name in this room. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You're so good, Father. We love you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord this morning. But as you are seated this morning, I just want to take a second and say this. Advent is all about expectation, all about arrival all about the coming of a king. But what's amazing is as we prepare for the coming of the king, Jesus comes as a baby. But the beautiful thing about it is as we just sang that you have no rival, you have no equal, now and forever, God, you reign within you if you felt that excitement if you felt that anticipation what you are experiencing is just a small taste of what heaven's going to be like it's just a small taste of when one person says yes to jesus heaven roars and it doesn't just roar just like a lion it doesn't just roar like the sound of an engine, it roars so loudly that hell shakes. That the adversary is reminded that he does not win. And as we come together in the Lord's presence this morning, and as Jesus gathered together around this table, he did that saying, you guys just wait. You guys just wait. It's gonna be painful. It's gonna cost a lot. But it's so that we can experience the roar of heaven, not just now, but forever, but forever. So that's what we prepare for. And as the disciples gathered around those ta the table, they, they were ready, they thought they were ready. And we think we're ready. But Jesus says, just wait, just wait. So as we're expectant about the season of Advent, as we are expectant on the arrival of the coming of the King, it's not just about a baby. We are preparing for forever. And so I prepare you as you prepare your heart, would, you, would that be your heart and your expectation as you prepare to come to the Lord's table? Because when we come to the Lord's table, he shows up. So get ready. So get ready. And as we prepare in that same vein, in that same heart, I prepare, I'd ask that you'd join with me in our prayer of contrition that you can find on the screen. Most merciful God, 
We confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name and amen. And as a minister of the gospel, it is my joy and privilege to say that as you have prayed that prayer, you are forgiven. And the Lord, our God, the, the Christ child sees you, he knows you, and he loves you. So as we prepare to enter into this time, I'd ask our, our ushers, uh, excuse me, our communion ushers and the prayer team that's going to be joining us to go ahead and come forward. Uh, and if you're joining with us online, I would invite you to go ahead and, and prepare your elements to come with us uh, as you enter into this time of communion as the body and the blood together. Uh, and let's experience the Lord together. We're grateful to have you with us. You see, on the night that Jesus uh, was betrayed, he was in the upper room uh, and they shared a meal together, him and his disciples, his brothers. And after they gathered together, uh, as they gave thanks and they shared and fellowship together, uh, he first, he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Thank you, Jesus, for your body. May we never take it for granted. And when the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks. And he drank it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, take and drink. This cup is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. That every time you drink from it, you would remember me, all that I've done and all that I will do. And what he called for the disciples to do and what he's calling for each one of us to do is that as often as we take this bread and eat it and drink from this cup, we celebrate all that God has done. We sit in what he is doing and we prepare in expectancy for what he is coming back to do in expectation of the joy of Advent. So as we prepare to eat, I'm gonna pray over our elements and we're gonna take by intention. And what that means is you'll be given a piece of bread and you dip it into the juice and you partake. And there'll be prayer team members here uh, and the altar would be open as well. Feel free to come uh, as, as the Lord leads you. Father God, we love you, Lord, and we thank you for this day. Thank you for your body and your blood. Lord, would you take this ordinary bread and this ordinary juice and make it for us, your body and your blood, Lord, that it would be used to make much of your name. We ask this in the matchless name of Jesus, and amen.
returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand on Christ the solid rock I stand all the ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand on Christ the solid or calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand oh come let us adore him oh come let us adore Would you stand, go across the aisles, greet one another with the, pass the peace of Christ to one another. Blessings. Online family, it's so good to see you. Uh, we don't just say family as a general term. We really believe whether this is your first time joining in with us or you've been a part of our ministry forever, uh, you are family. And so we take this time as you hear people fellowshipping together here in person, uh, we get the opportunity now to say the peace of Christ that lives within us wherever you are, whether you are in your car this week, uh, you are running home, uh, you're joining in with us from home. Uh, we love you and Jesus loves you. And we want to pass that peace right now. Uh, as we enter into this Advent season, never forget the expectation of the coming King. Uh, and if you have any questions, feel free to drop a comment down below uh, or reach out to our church office and our family would love to make sure you have what you need. We love you and we look forward to spending time together with you soon. Peace of Christ, Christ Church family, to you, from me and my family. I love this time of year. It's so um, just special to be um, with the people of God, worshiping Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. As you make your way back to your seats this morning, um, just a couple of things that we want to 
bring to your attention. Um, all of our Christchurch kids, sixth grade and under, you can go ahead and make your way out to your time of worship and learning with Miss Christy. If you're new with us, welcome. Um, if, you're, if you've got kids that are new with us, um, you can just go right through the double doors on the balcony level and the kids ministry team will, will meet them there. Again, if you're new with us, my name's Shelby Anderson. I serve on our staff here and um, we're, we're not a perfect church. You're gonna, you're gonna learn that real quickly. Um, but we serve a perfect God, amen? Uh, we're a people on mission to bring hope and wholeness through Christ. We can't do it in and of, of ourselves. We're gonna fail every single time, but he won't fail, amen? And if, if you're, if you, maybe you joined us for the first time last night at the concert or you're back for the first time in a while and you're seeing, you know, a lot of new faces, we want to make sure that we um, get to know you. And we have a, three ways that you can connect with us easily. Um, you can meet us out in the lobby. We have a fantastic connect team that's there to, to, to welcome you and to help you get plugged in into the life of our church. You can also send us a text, 615-205-1098, keyword connect, or you can fill out a card. Um, um, right in front of you on your pew. Drop that in as the offering bags are passed or with one of our ushers at the doors. And we just wanna make sure that we, um, we, don't let any, we don't want anyone to come in here and walk out and not get to know someone. And so that's our heart behind that. Um, and then we have a digital bulletin. If you scan the QR code that's on the screen or in front of you, we've got a lot of updates about what's going on in the life of, a, of the church. If you have any prayer requests, it's a great place to submit those. You can um, see what upcoming gatherings are coming um, in the life of the church. This week, we've got recovery Friday nights. Saturday morning, we have a men's breakfast that's unbelievable. I got to go last week uh, or last month and take some pictures and we had a lot of fun. And so um, come on out um, this Saturday. I was and like, why are you at the <laughs> <laughs> That makes sense. They let me take pictures. So, <laughs> hey, you know, um, it, was, it was awesome. So, uh, and, and lots more things. So please, every single week, we want you to get in the rhythm. Scan this, learn what's going on. There's also, if you're old school, we do for Advent only. Tell me for Advent only. We have a paper calendar um, also that you can have at the, uh, at the Connect Ball. If you want to take that home, put that on your fridge. Yes, okay. Um, and uh, at this time, Pastor Ben is going to come with us, uh, come up and share an update about our giving goal. Um, we set a goal in October, and he's going to give us a quick update and All let right. us know about it. Thank you, Shelby. Yeah. So before we prepare to give our tithes and offerings and continue in worship in that way this morning, uh, a month ago, we let you know of a giving goal we had for the end of the year to uh, realize before January 1st of the new year arrives. And that figure was $865,000, okay? I also told you at that time that if that seems like a lot of money, it is a lot of money. But when it comes to Christ Church, the way Christ Church tends to give, we see often 30% of our budget come in in the last few months of the year. We see 15% uh, alone usually come in in the month of December. So I want you to know the latest update, uh, and you can find this right on our website uh, if you check that out under our giving tab. But as of this past week, we have uh, given collectively 525,000 of that 865. So that's a wonderful thing. So thank you, Christ Church. So if my sixth grade math serves me well, that means we have 340,000 left. But I'm confident that as we, we follow the, the guidance and direction of the Lord, we can absolutely reach that goal by the end of the year. I would love it if we exceeded that. I would love it if we could go beyond that and we enter 2024 even stronger than, than ever and uh, financially. So, so as you are preparing now, we, we do not compel you or force you or any of those ways to give. We are people that believe we are in, in, privileged to give back to the Lord who's given so much, first and foremost, his son, and what it means to be part of his people called by his name for such a time as this in the life of his world, amen? So would you pray with me as we prepare our hearts and minds to give this morning? Father, we are so thankful for the blessing that it is to be called people who are Christians, to be called by the name of the one whom we follow. And as he laid down his life, for us, as he said, greater love has no one than to lay down his life for his friends. Lord, there are so many ways we can do that 
in our day-to-day lives, Lord, to sacrifice for one another, to give generously, Lord, whatever that may look like. And so, Father, you are the one, as the Apostle Paul said, we are to search our hearts and seek how you would direct us to give. And so, Father, may you do that for every heart and mind that hears the sound of my voice right now. May we give in obedience to you, however you direct us, however you lead us. And so we are thankful that you are allowing us to to meet this goal. We're thankful that you are are, are allowing us to continue to serve your community uh, that surrounds us, to serve one another as the body of Christ, to care for this campus with which you've entrusted us, Lord, of which I know you have so many great things in store as we continue to minister and serve in the year ahead. So, Father, we trust you. As we've already said, our hope is in you the God who comes, the God who acts, the God who has plans yet to unfold for your people. So we give in anticipation, not out of compulsion. We give out of gratefulness, not out of demand. And we are thankful and honored, Lord God, to be obedient in this way. We love you, we trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may give as the Bags are passed. You may give online uh, as our QR code will lead that to you. You also may give through our website directly. May God bless you as you give. Amen. the night wind to the little land do you see what I see way up in the sky little land do you see what I see a star a star dancing in the night with a tail as big as a kite with a tail as big as a kite said the little lamb to the shepherd boy
Choir, thank you again so much. All of our musicians as well. What, what a blessing, as, as Pastor Howie already said. Last night was amazing. But, uh, but you know what? We get the blessing every single week of you leading us as you do. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a privilege. Man. Don't ever take that for granted, Christ Church. I'm not saying you do. I'm just saying don't. All right? All right. If you're able, would you please stand to your feet with me for the reading of God's word coming to us today from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 64, verses 1 through 9. Hear now the word of the Lord. The prophet proclaims, Oh, that you would burst from the heavens and come down. How the mountains would quake in your presence as fire causes wood to burn and water to boil. Your coming would make the nations tremble. Then your enemies would learn the reason for your fame. When you came down long ago, you did awesome deeds beyond our highest expectations. And oh, how the mountains quaked. For since the world began, no ear has heard and no eye has seen a God like you who works for those who wait for him. You welcome those who gladly do good, who follow godly ways. But you have been very angry with us. For we are not godly. We are constant sinners. How can people like us be saved? We are all infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. Like autumn leaves, we wither and fall, and our sins sweep us away like the wind. Yet no one calls on your name or pleads with you for mercy. Therefore, you have turned away from us and turned us over to our sins. And yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay and you are the potter. We all are formed by your hand. Don't be so angry with us, Lord. Please don't remember our sins forever. Look at us, we pray, and see that we are all your people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Father, would you open our ears? Would you open our eyes? For neither ear has heard nor eye has seen a God like you who works for those who wait for him. Open our hearts now to receive your word, O oh Lord that we may know that we now, living centuries, millennia after Isaiah, know that the answer to his cry is the coming of Christ and that we are the recipients of your answer. What a blessing. What a gift. And let us better know what that means, that we may hope in you now because of what you have done in and through and by him. And it is in his wonderful name that we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, again, last night was, was amazing and we had a tremendous time. It was... Uh, a beautiful time of, of worship. It was more than a concert. It was a time to come together and, and tell the old, old story and hear the scripture proclaim the truth of, of who God is and what God has done. And it was truly a blessing to be able to share in that together. And so again, I wanna thank all of our, our musicians and everyone who's a part of that. And I especially wanna thank our leaders like, like Beth and, and Gavin and also, yes, very much so. And certainly, certainly I want to thank Mr. Otto Gross, our worship director. Yeah. It's been a big year uh, for many, many reasons, and, uh, and maybe uh, for none more than, than Otto. And uh, well done, brother. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. So as hopefully you're aware of by now, if you've been with us this morning, you know that today is indeed the first Sunday in the season of Advent. And the reason that we recognize Advent, which is these four weeks leading us up to Christmas, is to remind ourselves that our hope is not merely in a God who exists, 
somewhere out there, detached and distant from our lives. No. Advent reminds us that our hope is in a God who comes to be with us. That's why our theme for this Advent season is taken directly from the New Testament itself, that he is Emmanuel, which means God with us. Throughout Advent, we hear anew of the God who who acted then in the coming of Christ 2,000 years ago, and as Pastor Howie said, who will come again in that second Advent that only the Father knows fully when that will be and how that will come about. But as we live as people in this time between the times, we know that Christ still comes today. Christ still acts within our lives today in the presence and power of his spirit. He still comes to seek and save his people. He still comes to intercede for us and interact with us in this world that belongs to our Father. I hope that encourages you today because sometimes we forget. We need to be reminded. So in these weeks of Advent, which culminate in Christmas, we proclaim that Christ is God's ultimate answer to the cry of the prophet Isaiah, which we heard just moments ago. As he lashes out, oh, that you would tear open the heavens, that you would burst forth, oh God, and come down. For since the world began, no ear has heard, no eye has seen a God like you who works for those who wait for him. Advent is indeed this season, as Pastor Andrew said, of our waiting, of our expecting, our waiting upon the Lord, upon his arrival, upon his coming. That's what the word Advent literally means. It's derived from the Latin advenio, which means the arrival, which means the coming of a king. And centuries before the incarnation, Isaiah again cried out to the Lord on behalf of the people of Israel for God to make his presence known as powerfully as he had done before. And you know the stories. Isaiah was recalling what God had done with Moses on Mount Sinai, what God had shown himself to be in the wilderness, in the desert with the the Israelites during the Exodus. In generations past, oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down and make the mountains quake in the power of your presence, Isaiah said. Like a fire which burns the forest and boils the sea. Show your enemies who you truly are. With awesome deeds, mighty miracles we did not expect. Isaiah knows how to paint the picture, does he not? So how many of us today, how many of us are crying out in the same way, saying, God, make your presence known powerfully in our own lives with that kind of power today? How many of us can echo Isaiah's lament? Because that's what this is. How many of us have seen, like our Israelite forebears, God move powerfully in our lives in the past? Am I the only one? And so that leaves us in a tough place in the waiting because we do exactly what Isaiah is doing. And we say, do it again, Lord. Do it again, come. Make your presence known. Move. Save us. And we ask, what are you waiting for? And yet, the prophet Isaiah waited. The people of Israel waited. And how many of you know that sometimes, so too must we? We struggle with waiting I, I can't imagine if, if anybody came from the 5th century B.C. and tried to see how little we have to wait for today, I, their head would explode. Perhaps there's never been a people on the face of the earth that struggles more with waiting than we do for all kinds of reasons. But here's the thing. It is in the waiting that we learn so much about something so important, for it is in the waiting that we learn the most about hope. Especially when things do not unfold as we would predict or as we would prefer. I don't know if that's ever happened to you. When everything falls apart, when what seemed at one time so clear, all of a sudden it becomes so clouded 
when things do not go our way and we cannot even find the way, and even if we could, we do not have the strength within us to follow it, that is when we learn what it actually means to hope. That's when we actually find out what we know about hope. Prophets, like Isaiah, they know an awful lot about hope. Not wishful thinking. Some people think that's what hope is. It's not. Not toxic positivity. Some people think that's what hope is, and it, it's not. Toxic positivity is, is blind to the, the truly negative things around us and within us, which need to change, which need to be healed, which need to be addressed if anything is going to actually get better. No. The prophets don't deal in false hope. That's a thing. The prophets don't deal in it, and neither should we. The prophets seek and speak the truth, as all God's people should. And the truthful language, the form which the prophets most often use is poetry. That should come as no surprise to most of us. And why do they use poetry? Poetry is what speaks to and from the heart in ways that no other form of, of human communication can. You all know this is true. We've been experiencing this all morning. We experienced it all afternoon and evening. Songwriters do the same thing, right? We might not talk as much about prophets or, or even maybe as much about poets in our society, which is a shame, but when it comes to songwriting, that's, that's different, and I thank God for it. Songwriters speak this poetic language which has so much to tell us about the true meaning of the hope that is ours in Christ if we will receive it. We've been singing it all morning. In Christ alone, what? My hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. And then we go on. This cornerstone, this solid ground, Firm through the fiercest drought. And what? And storm. Sing it with me. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ, I stand. That's poetry. I can preach for five hours and it won't do anything like singing that one verse will do to you. You know what I mean? Yeah. Diane shared with us so beautifully along with Howie here minutes ago and, and Piper led us in this one, but, but, but it bears repeating. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Sing it now. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking Yeah. That's the power of poetry. Christ isn't a stone. He's not literally a rock. And yet what he says, that who hears my voice, he who lives by what I have to say, builds his house, builds his life upon solid rock. And when the winds and the waves and the storms of this life rage against you, your house will stand. Anyone and anything else, it's like building on shifting sand. And when those same storms come, and they will, and you know it's true, that house will fall. Jesus is the greatest prophet of all. He doesn't sugarcoat things. He doesn't deny things. He doesn't deal in toxic positivity. He doesn't deal in, 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 in pretending that things aren't going to get hard. He isn't dealing with those things. He says the storms will come. Hard times will come. In this life, you will face tribulation. But take heart, he said. 
Why? For I have overcome the world. See, the question about hope is, who do you put your hope in? Hope needs an object. You can't have hope for hope's sake, just like you can't have faith for faith's sake. We don't have faith in faith. We don't have hope in hope. Our faith is in God. Our hope is in him. Well, what about another one? This is one of my favorite, favorite. If I, if I had to take all of the Christmas carols and, and distill it down to just one part of one verse that I think just is so beautiful, it's this. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. Here it is. A thrill of hope. The weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Stop. Stop. I know you want to get to the high note, but stop. (laughs) That's the problem with that carol. Everybody's waiting to see, can she hit it? Can she hit it? Is he gonna crack? That's, that's what everybody wants. And we blow right through those lyrics. And I wanna, I wanna cry. I'm like, just, just stop right there. Stop right there. We're gonna come back to that. We're gonna unpack what the, what the carol writer has to say there. But first, back to Isaiah. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens, that you would rip apart the skies and come down, the prophet cries. But you don't, he goes on to say. Now remember, this is Isaiah speaking to the people of Israel. Uh, scholars disagree about when this was written exactly. Was it 7th century? Was it 5th century? Uh, they, they argue about the timing. But, but the context is this, that, that, that the Israelites have come back from, from, from exile in Babylon. King Cyrus of, of Persia has, has allowed them to come back to, to their homeland, come back to Jerusalem, to come back to Judah. And, and yet things are not going so well. Why? because people are people. And all the visions they had of returning home and and, and all the grandeur and and, and rebuilding the temple and all of the things that they thought were going to happen when they came back, all those ideas of perfection are falling apart around them and it's a mess. And Isaiah is crying out on behalf of the people saying, why don't you come? And he says, but you don't because we are not godly. We are constant sinners and how can a people like us be saved, he says. We are all infected and impure with sin. And he says, even when we do our very best, even when we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but but filthy rags. The Hebrew says they are like used menstrual cloths. Like autumn leaves, we wither and fall, dried up and dead within. And our sins sweep us away like the cold winter wind. That's as raw as it gets. That's Isaiah speaking from his heart, speaking on behalf of his people. We are so far gone, Isaiah laments, so dead in our sins, so hardened in our hearts that no one even calls upon your name. No one pleads with you for mercy. That is why you have turned your face away from us and turned us over to the consequences of our sins, to the consequences of our iniquity, the older versions say. My God, how long lay the world in sin and error, pining. Do you know what it means to pine? It's not a word we use much in our contemporary English. It has nothing to do with Christmas trees. Some, some of you may remember, uh, there's an old Herman's Hermit song, uh, Mrs. Brown, you've got a lovely daughter. Remember that song? Yes. Otto does. <laughs> Otto does. The only reason I bring that up is because in the chorus, you know, there's the last line, it ain't no good to pine. Nobody knows what that means. Maybe if you were in England in 1965, you did when that song was a hit. To pine means, listen to this, it means to yearn intensely and persistently for something unattainable. So I bet there's been a time in your life where you have indeed pined, you just didn't know that's what you were doing to yearn and persistently, intensely for something that you cannot attain. Those who pine are 
desiring something, yearning for something they believe they cannot reach. It is unattainable, it is impossible, it is almost, dare I say, unimaginable. So many in the world of Isaiah and ancient Israel knew what it meant to pine away in sin and grief and loss, and so do so many in our world today. So do so many of us in this room. So do so many of us watching online right now. Someone here this morning, you were thinking to yourself, Isaiah is reading my mail. Isaiah is speaking my language. Isaiah is singing my song. Somebody here right now, your heart is like a dry, brittle autumn leaf. You're just like the ones Isaiah is speaking about. And in your pining, you have begun to believe what Isaiah was tempted to believe, that God has turned his face from you, that he has turned you over to the consequences of your sin, or that he has turned you over to the depths of your grief, and that his presence, his comfort is unattainable to you. Long lay the world in sin and error and all that comes from that, like grief and doubt and fear and anxiety and despair and all of those things pining. You see, hope, what hope is, hope is, is trusting confidently. Again, but it depends upon the object of your hope. Hope is expecting to obtain that which you hope for. Hope is expecting the fulfillment of what has been promised. But again, you have to ask, who is the one who has made the promise? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood, his righteousness. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. Proverbs 13, 12 tells us that hope deferred, which means hope delayed, hope put off, makes the heart sick. Why? Because over time, now hear me, some of you are going to say, yeah, I get that. Over time, the more we wait, the more we pine, the longer we suffer in sin or grief or fear or anxiety or injustice, the more likely our imagination will run away with us and it will run us away from hope. We will begin, over time, the longer we are in these circumstances, to believe that things will not change. Anybody ever been there? We'll be, begin to believe that they cannot change, that we can no longer imagine that things could, will get better. We begin to believe that this is just the way it is and this is the way it will always be. Or maybe, maybe it'll only get worse. The number of people that I listen to in our society today at large, when I'm in a coffee shop or I'm in a restaurant or I'm standing in the, the checkout line at the store, the number of people that I hear around me that are increasingly thinking this way, is, it, 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 it's alarming. That the way things are is just the way they are. There's nothing that can be done about it. So I gotta protect me and mine. Good luck with you and yours. And we'll just see how this shakes down. But when everything hits the fan, it's every man, woman, child for themselves. God have mercy. Isaiah was speaking to a group of people who thought that same way. I believe the Holy Spirit is speaking to a group of people today that need to make sure that we don't fall into that category, that we don't allow ourselves to lose hope in that way. Losing hope means you can no longer imagine that God is at work for us as we wait for him. Don't forget what Isaiah said. But here's the thing. Everybody turn to your neighbor and say, hope has a big butt. Thank you. I don't think there's anybody here named Hope today. If you are, I should have thought that through. My apologies to Hope, wherever you may be. I'm speaking, of course, in theological terms, not, yes, you know what I mean. But you're gonna remember that now, and that's, this is why it's so important. 
Hope has a big but. Because if you are here, not hope, but if you are here, all the rest of you, is because there is yet something that is still alive within you, no matter how dark it has seemed, no matter how hard this year has been, no matter what you are walking through right now that you never would have chosen, predicted, or imagined, you would have to face, and certainly not have to face it right now. No matter what that may be, you are here because there is yet something alive within you, something Isaiah had yet alive within him, and that is hope. Thank God that you can still imagine the way that Isaiah could imagine that God is not done yet. If there is breath in your lungs, he is not done with you yet. If you are a Christian, even if there isn't breath in your lungs anymore, he's still not done with you yet. What God has started, God will finish. What God has promised, God will bring to pass. That is what God does because it is directly consequential to who he is. Isaiah goes on, chapter 64, starting with verse eight, he says, and yet, O Lord, even with all of our sin, with all of our failure, with all of our blindness and stumbling in the dark, you are our Father. We are made in your image, which means that we are more than than dead leaves. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are all formed by your hand. Don't ever forget that he has made you that you are here on purpose, that he has placed you here for his purpose, given you purpose by his life within you. Isaiah says, we belong to you. You have made us, we are yours. So please do not remember our sins, our iniquity forever. Look at us, Isaiah says, see us, Lord, we pray, and see that we are all your people even in the midst of unbelievable darkness, Isaiah has hope. The poetry of the prophet speaks for the people Israel, and today, my friends, the poet, the prophet speaks for us. Now again, the lyrics of that beloved carol, back to it, they speak so powerfully of God's reply. Remember, God's reply, ultimately, to Isaiah's cry, is none other than the cry of the Christ child in the manger. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. When Christ was born, the worth of your soul and mine The worth of every human life was revealed by our Father like never before. Do you see that? Do you know that? In all of the sin, in all of the failures and mistakes of humanity, in all of our grief and our suffering, in all of the long waiting and weariness, finally a thrill of hope. The weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Have you ever watched the sunrise? It is my absolute favorite time of the day. I didn't feel that way when I was 15. (laughs) But I do now. Have you ever sat still? in the quiet and you've seen the darkness, the blackness of the horizon and all of a sudden you begin to make out the streaks of the deepest violet of the richest indigo just starting to be painted across the eastern sky and before you can even imagine how someone could paint with such beauty. Hues of of pink and crimson begin to take shape and even emerald green is seen mixed within them and soon there's orange and and, and pretty soon uh, here comes gold and little by little by little you're seeing the light breaking in and then, and then, 
Finally, the sun itself crests the horizon. It is a sacred experience, and every single morning as I watch it happen, I, I give God thanks. No two sunrises are the same, but they are consistent as his faithfulness is. The Son of God, the S-O-N, not the S-U-N, but the S-O-N of God comes in the same way. Light breaks in upon a new day and darkness is defeated. That's what the writer means when he says, yonder breaks in the distance a new and glorious morn. Do you realize how blessed we are to live in this time between the two advents of Christ? Because we are those who are able to see this new and glorious morn. Looking back on that first Christmas, we are the ones who who know that the light has dawned and the light still shines in the darkness. The darkness is still here, but the darkness cannot, will not, ever overcome, extinguish the light. What an amazing time to live. What an amazing time by God's providence and God's sovereignty to have been born as we are right now even with the hardships that we face, even with the sin that sometimes seems to overwhelm us, even with all of our fears and faults and failures, even with all the ways that we fail God, one another, and ourselves, we are blessed. We are so blessed. What Isaiah could only see by faith, we now can look back on with surety. And so that's why it is that On behalf of his people, we now, there's another song, and it's not a Christmas song per se, it's an Easter song, but but that's the beauty of it. We can't talk about Christ being born without talking about him being raised. Because both of those things have to fully inform who we are as his people in the world today. We are people of the miracle of the incarnation, of the beauty of the first coming of Christ. We are people of the resurrection. So that even if this body fails me, I know that I shall live because he lives. Remember that song? Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Remember that one? Because he lives, all fear is gone. All fear is gone. Why? Because I know He holds what? The future. So no matter what. And life is worth the living just because he lives. Yeah. Another prophet who doesn't always sound as hopeful as Isaiah, but yet still writes these profound words according to tradition in the book of Lamentations. The the prophet Jeremiah says this. Remember, hope has a big butt. He didn't say that. (laughs) But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. I want to pause there for a second. How he's right. Sometimes preachers read scripture and then we stop and we pause and we say things. Some of you here today believe that God's mercy for you is done. Some of you here today believe that, you know what, it's, it's, I've gone, it's too far. Jeremiah says, who most likely lost his life speaking the word of the Lord, his mercies never end. His mercies never end. He goes on. Because the steadfast of the love of the Lord never ceases, his mercies are new every morning, like the dawn itself. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. In a minute, we're going to pray for and with each other in the context of of hope. But before we do, let me read you one last passage from Isaiah chapter 40, starting with verse 27. Isaiah, such a rich, rich 
text that we will pull from time and again throughout this Advent season leading to Christmas. He is the, the prophet who, who prophesies of the suffering servant, the one who would be the Messiah, the one who would live for us, who would die for us, the one who would be raised again for us, the one who would bring us the hope and the peace and the joy and the love that Advent reminds us of because he is those things. And he is alive. So how much more should we be able to agree with Isaiah when he writes? He says, oh, Jacob, how can you say the Lord does not see your troubles? Oh, Israel, how can you say God ignores your rights? Have you never heard? Have you never understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to the weak. He gives strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weak and tired and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in, those who wait upon, those who hope in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. If you come into my study, you will see there's a a print with an eagle that hangs on the wall behind my desk. My good friend Brian gave it to me four and a half years ago. And it quotes Isaiah 40, 31. What Brian didn't know is that when God called me to this role, I was searching high and low for that very picture. I had seen it once years ago. In fact, I think I was in high school, and I could not find it. I'm looking every, you think you can find everything on Amazon. I couldn't find it anywhere. I believe the Lord had, had told me, had spoken to me through Isaiah 40, 31, that when you come to this role, Ben, when you come to Christ church, those who... Wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. That was a word that he gave, gave me coming four and a half years ago. And I need you to know this. And, and probably four months in, Brian comes walking down the hall in the offices. And he says, I got something that I think God wants me to give you. And it was that exact print. The exact one. God is faithful. Eugene Peterson said, if we have faith in God's willingness to act on our behalf, it is possible to wait for him to act. And the waiting isn't a waiting of anxiety, but a waiting of anticipation. It is based on the certainty that God is coming. All of Israel's waiting, all of our waiting was fulfilled in the coming of Jesus. God comes. He continues to come. He comes certainly, but not always in the ways that we can prescribe or predict. So here's what I want us to do. Right where you are, I'm going to ask you in a moment to turn to someone next to you. If that means you've got to move across the aisle, you've got to move across the section, or maybe somebody is going to be laid on your heart and God's going to call you to move up into the balcony or come down from the balcony, whatever it might be. But here's what we're going to do. Hope is alive because he is alive. And so what we're going to do is we're going to pray for, we're going to pray with each other. And what I'm going to invite you to do is share with someone next to you, share with someone around you what it is that you need encouragement in as you need your hope strengthened in God. I know enough of you too well to know there are are hard things that we are facing. There are difficult things you're experiencing. There are things right now that you're waiting on the Lord and you're trusting in him. But you could use a little bit of reinforcement with that trust right now. You could use not only the support and encouragement of the Holy Spirit, but you could use the support and encouragement of brothers and sisters in Christ also filled with the Spirit coming alongside you and agreeing with you in prayer. Amen? So let's do that right now. Let me open us up, and then I'm going to ask you to move. Lord, we pray right now that you would allow us to be bold in sharing with one another. Father, allow us to to hear 
the hearts of our brothers and sisters to encourage one another, to speak the truth as prophets before have spoken the truth in love of what it means to trust in you, to encourage each other, Lord God, to lift one another up. Some right now hearing my voice I know are dealing with pain they could never have imagined, they could never have predicted they would have to be dealing with right now in the way they are facing it. I know that there are those of us in this room that that can describe their present experience in that way. So, Lord, you know our hearts. To you, all hearts are open. All desires are known. From you, no secrets are hidden. And so, Lord, will you now show us how to pray for and with one another. Lord, Holy Spirit, give us the words. Even when we don't have the words, may we just lock arms with each other and stand together, trusting in you. Our hope is built on nothing less, Lord, than your goodness, your faithfulness, your love, all revealed most fully in your Son. So now, Lord, let us love each other, praise you, and thank you, and glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're not going to come back together to dismiss you. I want you to pray with each other, tarry as long as the Lord leads you. And when the time feels right to move on from there, please do so. But may the Lord bless you as you pray for each other. May he keep you as you lift one another up. May he continue to make himself himself known to us. And Isaiah had said, he turned his face away. God has turned his face toward us in Christ. Let us remind each other of that now and encourage one another in prayer. Please, let's pray for each other.